Hello, welcome to the first part of a series of presentations on the dynamics of drilling and drill strings. There are 10 presentations, starting with a general introduction and covering the different dynamic modes of the drilling process and how they couple together. Two of the longest presentations are split into two, so there are 12 videos in total. We start with an introduction to the whole system and the three structural modes that propagate between the surface and the bit axial motion, fluid flow and rotation, with an emphasis on the axial dynamics of drilling. The second presentation is all about understanding rotational motion and how the properties of the bit play a key role. The third is also largely about rotation, though now it is the role of the periodic structure of the drill pipe that is highlighted. The fourth and fifth relate to the low frequency behaviour of the fluid that is pumped through the system, with just the normal frictional and bit pressure drops in the fourth and in the fifth, the more complicated behaviour that results when a fluid-driven positive displacement motor couples together the fluid, rotational and axial motion of the system. The sixth talk explains what happens when proportional integral controllers get put on top of the drilling system, both as auto drillers and top drive controllers, mainly the former. Presentation seven looks at fluid acoustics at higher frequencies. This part is fairly self-contained and will be of particular interest to anyone looking at fluid pulse telemetry systems. Presentations 8 to 10 are also pretty much standalone, though an appreciation of the role of periodicity from presentation 3 is useful. 8 and 9 look at how drill strings behave quasi statically under compression, and we finish with full lateral dynamics, including the effects of compression, in presentation 10. Despite the length, there is still a lot not covered, and I make no claim of completeness. Whirl in particular is omitted, because I never felt I understood it well enough, and there are only a few remarks about what happens with rotocone bits on the sharp end. Also, slide drilling is not considered, something I really should think about more. I've worked in this area for the last 30 years, and much of the theoretical work has not been published, so there should be a lot of novel material. All views are my own and may well differ from those of other experts. I hope these presentations will be useful to people from a wide range of backgrounds, from practical drilling engineers to applied mathematicians. The advantage of recordings is that you could go back and look again at derivations, and you can also skip over the difficult parts to get to the results. There is a lot of maths in these presentations, but my aim is also that those for whom the maths is challenging will find a lot of useful content. The maths may be complicated, but the conclusions are normally quite straightforward. If you want to understand the maths, you'll probably have to pause quite a lot, but it's worth the time. Before we get on to drilling, a bit about myself. From 1990 to 2020, I worked for Schlumberger in research. I was originally hired to work on axial wave propagation in drill strings, and over my 30-year career, I kept returning to drill string dynamics. I also worked on MWD, measurement while drilling, on seismics and on unconventional drilling methods. I hold over 70 different patents, mainly drilling related, but some excellent seismic ones too. Before this, I trained as a mathematical physicist. I gained my doctorate at Oxford in general relativity at the Maths Institute and continued in that area as a postdoc in Germany. Then I spent three years working on structural acoustics and anti-sound, which was why Schlumberger originally hired me to work on waves and drill strings. First, an outline of what you should get out of this first talk. An understanding of what the drilling system is and the key parts of it from a modelling perspective, and also of the difference between things which happen fast, early times, and things which happen slowly, late times. Then I will show simple late time models for how the drill bit moves forward through the rock, axial dynamics, and also how changes in fluid flow rate near the bit differ from the fluid flow rate change from the pumps. And finally, a few words on rotational dynamics and how it differs from axial and fluid dynamics. The drilling system is quite complicated at the two ends and much simpler in between. At the top, there's a drilling rig. The actual drilling part on this jack-up rig is the mast on the left from where the drill string hangs. And this is also where the top drive that rotates the pipe is. The hydraulic pumps that send fluid around the system are on the platform. This is over the sea, though sitting on the seafloor. Land rigs are basically similar, although they don't have to be so self-contained. 
you can see here the stairs going up to the rig floor, which is well above the ground to fit in everything that needs to go at the top of the well, the blowout preventers and the pipework for the drilling fluid return. Whatever the rig size, there's machinery to move the top of the drill string up and let it down, rotate it and pump fluid. There's a lot of power involved, tens to hundreds of kilowatts. At the bottom, there's a bit cutting rock of course. Also fluid emerging through nozzles from the inside of the pipe into the annulus and other tools. There may be a fluid driven motor. What is shown here is a rotary steerable system, which has pads that push the drill string over to one side of the hull to control the bit direction. The Conocenti will recognise this as a Baker Hughes auto track. There will likely be an MWD system sending information back up the drill string using pressure pulses that come from an orifice with a time varying aperture. These tools, and the bit, couple different modes of motion and also convert a lot of the steady state power coming down the drill string into vibration of various kinds. All the pictures I am showing are courtesy of Attilio Pisoni of Baker Hughes, who I would like to thank for helping me out, and their images are copyright Baker Hughes. These two ends are connected by drill pipe. Here's a picture of some pipe, racked up, waiting to go in the hole. Pipe sections are normally 30 feet, or just under 10 metres long, but are normally run in and out of hole in triples, or in doubles in smaller rigs. With modern rigs equipped with a top drive, which turns the pipe at the top, drilling will also be carried out using triples, or doubles. You can see that the pipe sections are much thicker at the ends, the joints, where they screw into one another. This periodic area change is very significant for how axial and rotational waves propagate through drill pipe. At the bottom of the drill pipe are the collars, which are also just steel cylinders, but thicker, wider, and therefore heavier, and without area changes at the joints. This section, with not just collars, but other drilling tools, is known as the bottom hole assembly, or BHA. Here's another view from the bottom, which also shows how the pipe is turned. The top drive is on the right, which screws into the top pipe section and runs up and down on rails. All the maths that follows uses a one-dimensional approximation for the drill string, and that is because the drill string and the borehole are so much longer than they are wide. A typical borehole is on average about 30 centimetres wide, a drill string about 15 centimetres but they will be thousands of metres long. So long as we restrict ourselves to effects that happen over time scales that are long compared to the time it takes for sound to cross the drill string or the borehole, then we can replace the detailed 3D structure of the drill string by a 1D average. As a rough guide for time scales longer than a millisecond, or frequencies less than 1 kHz, a 1D approximation is fine. So what have we got? We have a long, thin system, with a lot going on at the bottom, and a lot going on at the top. Between them, the main thing happening is waves going up and down. And they go up and down at finite speed. There is a delay between something happening at the bit, and that something being seen at the surface. There is then another delay before the response to that something at the surface gets back down to the bit. That cumulative time is called the two-way time. On time scales smaller than the two-way time, we can study what happens at the bit and ignore the surface response. It might as well be at infinity. All that matters are the properties of the drill string. This is often called an outgoing radiation model because waves head up the drill string and on these time scales they don't come back. Over sufficiently long time scales, time scales at least as long as the two-way time, preferably a multiple of this, the whole system between the bit and the surface can be modelled by a few average parameters, known as lumped parameters, and as we shall see, this works well for studying axial and fluid dynamics. If you want to study what happens at timescales that are neither short nor long, then there is no alternative than to use some kind of detailed numerical model, because it's complicated. So when are times early, and when are they late? The answer of course is, it depends. The transition from early to late depends on the two-way time, which grows pretty much linearly with the length of the system or the depth of the hole, 
and also depends on the kind of vibration that is involved. Axial waves are much faster than fluid waves, so late times are much earlier for axial dynamics than they are for fluid dynamics. An early time model for a source of vibration in the middle of the drill string looks like the system on the left. The properties of the vibration source are matched to the impedance of the drill string, or fluid, above and below. Most of the early time models in these presentations look conceptually like the system on the right. Something happens very close to the bit, and the two interact, as a result of which some dynamic effect goes up the drill string. That interaction can be quite complicated. I've said that an averaging process takes us from a 3D model of the system to a 1D model, but not said what that actually means. The model now just has one coordinate, length, and along that length there are a small number of variables. Effectively, there is an infinitesimal rigid body at each point, which has six degrees of freedom. It can move in three directions, and it can rotate about three axes. It can move axially, it can move laterally in two directions, it can pivot laterally in two directions, and it can rotate about its log axis. Six degrees of freedom. The axial motion results in axial dynamics. The lateral motion and lateral pivoting combine to produce lateral dynamics, which has four of the six degrees of freedom. Drill string rotation gives rotational dynamics. In long boreholes, especially long boreholes which are not completely straight, which in practice is all of them, lateral motions do not propagate a long way. The lateral dynamics of the BHA is either not seen at all at the surface, or only because of secondary effects. I'll have a lot more to say about lateral dynamics and lateral statics in the final three presentations, but until then I will just be talking about axial and rotational motion, and also of course the final part of the system, the fluid in the pipe, which has a single degree of freedom. I've said that we end up with waves going up and down the drill string or borehole, but not anything about what that means. The three modes that propagate long distances, axial, rotational and fluid acoustic, are all to a reasonable approximation governed by a simple wave equation, and it's the same equation for all three, just with different variables and constants in it. There's a pair of first order partial differential equations one of which is simply F equals MA, Newton's law, and the other is Hooke's law, that stress is proportional to strain, or rather the time derivative of Hooke's law. When the material terms M and beta are constant, and there is no applied force F, solutions to this are, as is very well known, either waves moving forwards or backwards, with constant speed. They can be arbitrary functions U plus and U minus and the force is proportional to the velocity through the impedance, different sign in the two different directions. Much of the time, I will be decomposing the waves into different frequency and wave number components. Right, let's start by looking at the axial system. If the drill string were constant cross-section, axial waves would move up and down the steel pipe at about 5,000 meters per second. For reasons that will become clear in the third presentation, the effect of the tool joints on low frequency sound is to slow it down a bit, so typically axial waves travel at about 4,800 meters per second. Compared to the sound we are all used to, sound in air, these waves are very, very fast. Sound speed in air is about 300 meters per second. The crucial property for studying axial vibration in drill strings is the axial impedance. And this depends on the properties of the material they are made of, almost always some kind of steel, which has a density of about 8,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and also the cross-sectional area of the pipe. The impedance is the most important property at early times. Changes in impedance lead to reflections, so changes in area, such as between the collars and the drill string, produce reflections. For a three kilometer drill string, late times, begin at about one and a quarter seconds. For a longer drill string, six kilometers, about two and a half seconds. And for a very long nine kilometer drill string, this kind of length is unusual, but not unheard of, nearly four seconds. At late times, the drill string can be modeled by just a few parameters, 
and the crucial parameter for the axial dynamics is the compliance. The compliance is proportional to the length of pipe and inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. To give you a feeling for the effects of this compliance, for one kilometre of typical pipe, 5 inch or 12.5 centimetres in diameter, a change in axial force, weight on bit, of 2,000 pounds or about 1,000 kilograms will change the length by about one centimetre. So for instance, for a five kilometre well, when the bit goes on bottom and 10,000 pounds of weight on bit are applied, the drill string will get 25 centimetres shorter. This may not sound like much, but it means that if you come straight off bottom from drilling with 10,000 pounds on the bit and then go back on bottom, you will tag the bottom of the hole nearly a foot earlier than if you don't take account of this. The collars are much less compliant than pipe. You wouldn't normally have one kilometre of six and three quarter inch collars in the drill string, but if you did, for each 2,000 pounds of weight on bit, they would contract by only two millimetres. As weight is applied over these longer time scales, the drill string gets shorter, which is Hooke's law. When we are drilling, what is important is not position, but velocity. We can differentiate Hooke's law to get that the difference between the surface velocity, the speed the top of the drill string at the surface is being lowered by the travelling block, and the bit velocity, the speed the drill bit is drilling, is proportional to the rate of change of the weight on bit. This simple model assumes that the difference between the surface hook load and the bottom hole weight does not change with time, which for rotating drilling with a stand of pipe is a good approximation. For a vertical well, the difference is the buoyant weight of the drill string. When the drill bit is not rotating, of course nothing happens when weight is applied to the bit, apart from a tiny indentation. However, when rotating, for normal drilling, a surprisingly good model is simply that the rate of rock removal, i.e. the rate which the bit advances, is proportional to the weight applied. Mathematically, this makes the rock appear like a very viscous liquid, force proportional to velocity. The model, of course, only applies for forward velocity. Once the bit has cut rock, if it moves backwards, it is practically free. This all implies the equation on the right, where the proportionality is the rock drillability k, which depends on the position, where in the rock dr the drill bit is, and assumes that the drill bit is turning at approximately a constant speed. So now, with an equation that describes the bit velocity as a function of weight, we could convert it into a differential equation for weight, which is what you see in the top left, for constant rock drillability. The surface velocity, the velocity of the travelling block from which the drill string is suspended, is determined by the driller's brake. So we need to solve this to give the weight as a function of time in terms of the surface velocity, which is an arbitrary function of time, normally a non-negative function of time as the block moves downwards. But on a floating rig in a high sea, even with motion compensation, the block can move upwards. As anyone who has done a first course in differential equations knows, this equation is solved by multiplying through by an exponential, leading to the solution below. This looks complicated, but it isn't. It's a one-pole, low-pass filter. The weight is proportional to the surface velocity, filtered by a one-pole, low-pass filter, with time constant given by the compliance over the drillability. If all the values of the surface velocity are zero after time zero, i.e. the block stops moving at time zero, the weight decays exponentially. This is normally referred to as a drill-off. If we look at the downhole rate of penetration, it looks similar, but there is the drillability k in front of the low-pass filter. So there is more variability if k changes. If the rock is not uniform, the solution it's a one-pole, low-pass filter, but with a varying time constant, depending on K. So however hard the rock is to drill, the weight is still a low-pass filtered version of the travelling block motion. What does this mean in practice? Let's look at a synthetic example. The driller is setting the weight at an upper level, then holding the travelling block constant, so surface ROP is zero, until the weight goes down to a lower level, then lowering the block until the upper level is reached again. The graph shows the weight on bit, 
and you can see that each time the top of the drill string is stationary, the weight is declining exponentially. What is plotted here is the position of the top of the drill string in blue and of the drill bit in red, normalised so that at time zero they both start at zero. The rock is uniform of one strength above the green line, and you can see that while the surface velocity is zero, the bit is still drilling ahead, and the depth against time is not too bumpy. When the rock changes to one that is harder, unsurprisingly, the periods with the block stationary are longer. So what have we learned here? The relation between surface motion and downhill weight is very simple. It's just a low-pass filter. The same is true for downhill RAP, apart from the drillability factor. The time constant for the low-pass filter is simply the drill-off time, the exponential decay factor when performing a drill-off. The time constant depends on rock properties, drill bit rotation speed, and grows with drill string length. The time constant is normally seconds, a few seconds for a short drill string, tens of seconds for a long drill string, or longer for a long drill string of very hard rock. The whole system is modelled well as a linear system. Just because the top of the drill string is stationary, it doesn't mean the bit is. If there is weight on bit and rotation, the bit is drilling. There is a tendency among some drillers to come off bottom as soon as the travelling block has reached the bottom of its travel, even though they have weight on bit. This is a bad idea, for reasons that we'll get to later, as there is a lot of stored energy in the drill string, which is released very fast, but their motivation is that because they are not drilling, any time spent allowing weight to drill off is wasted. But the bit is still drilling, even if the travelling block is stationary. And it also means that when they go back on bottom, after more pipe is added, they will hit bottom earlier than they expect, due to the difference in drill string length at high weight and zero weight. Let's move on to the fluid system. And here, I'm really just looking at the fluid inside the drill string, not in the annulus. At the bottom of the drill string, the fluid goes through tight nozzles, and this largely creates a barrier between the dynamics of the fluid in the drill string and in the annulus. First, let's look at how fast sound moves in the fluid, as this determines what are early times and what are late times. Drill strings are all made of steel, but the fluid used to drill wells can vary hugely in its properties. Sound speed in water is about 1500 meters per second, which while very fast compared to air, is less than a third of the speed of axial waves in the drill string. Normally, drilling fluids contain a lot of water, either as a base fluid in water-based mud, was an emulsion in oil for oil-based mud. Drilling fluids normally contain a lot of salt, so the speed of sound in fluid in boreholes can actually be higher as a saturated salt solution has a higher sound speed, about 1600 meters per second. However, for drilling, weighting material is added to the fluid, and this slows sound down. So typical weighted water-based muds have sound speeds between about 1200 and 1400 meters per second. There are a number of differences in the acoustics of oil-based muds, OBM. Firstly, they are normally slower, as oil is more compliant than water. As a broad brush, sound speeds will be between 1000 and 1300 meters per second. While water's density and bulk modulus do not vary greatly with temperature and pressure, those of oil can vary significantly so the sound speed close to the bit may be significantly different to its value at the surface. The lower bulk modulus of oil means that the acoustic impedance of oil-based mud is less than water-based mud, and the whole system is a lot softer. We will see the implications of this later. But back to the subject of early and late times. Obviously they start much later than for axial waves, about 5 seconds for a 3000 meter drill string going up to over 15 seconds for a very long 9,000 meter drill string. The maths of late time fluid dynamics are surprisingly similar to those of the axial dynamics. There is an obvious similarity in what is happening at the surface. The top of the drill string is moving down, the fluid is being pumped down. There are similarities at the bottom too. 
Both systems are dissipative. The weight on bit increases as the bit speed increases. The pressure drop at the bit increases as the fluid flow rate increases. In writing equations that look similar, the variables are a bit different. For axial motion, we use a force of velocity. For fluid flow, it's not force but pressure, force over area that matters, and not velocity but volume flow rate. There are differences, of course. In fluid flow, there is a frictional pressure gradient along the pipe. How the impedance depends on cross-sectional area is actually the inverse compared to axial waves. And there is some effect of what is going on in the annulus, which has no equivalent for axial waves. But to start with the similarities. At late times, the whole system between bit and surface looks like a spring with a compliance. Just like for the axial waves, it is proportional to length, but in contrast to the axial compliance, which is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area, as thicker pipe is stiffer, it is proportional to the cross-sectional area. It is actually proportional to the total volume of fluid in the pipe. What does this compliance mean? For water, a pressure change of 1 MPa, or about 150 pounds per square inch, changes the fluid volume contained in 1,000 metres of typical drill pipe by 3.6 litres. Water-based mud, due to the added solids, will be slightly stiffer than this. Oil-based mud, on the other hand, can be much less stiff, up to twice as compliant, so double the volume change. So what does the dynamics actually look like at late times? Here, I'm going to make a big approximation, which is that all the pressure drop is at the bit, not along the pipe. And then we get an equation that looks very similar to the one for axial velocity, namely that the difference between the surface and bit values is proportional to the rate of change of a force term, the pressure here, the weight for axial motion. There is a big difference though hiding in this equation, which is that the pressure drop across the bit is not proportional to flow, but proportional to flow squared. Now, actually, in the BHA, there may be other components with quadratic pressure drops too, but they are all close together so I'm going to aggregate them as a bit pressure drop. I'm going to call the proportionality factor between pressure drop and half the flow rate squared, the bit nozzle constant, capital K. So this is now the pair of equations to solve, with pressure P written in terms of the bit flow rate. Let's look at what happens when the flow rate varies slightly, so the equation can be linearized. I'll remove this restriction when we return to the fluid in the fourth presentation. Not surprisingly, it looks identical to the equation for downhole RIP, except with different constants and variables. It's a one-pole, low-pass filter, with a time constant that is proportional to the compliance, and hence the drill string length. One difference between the fluid and axial equations is that there is nothing like the rock drillability, which can change suddenly. The equivalent is the bit nozzle constant, and that remains constant. It does, however, vary with mean flow rate, so increasing the mean flow rate proportionally increases the time constant. Finally, a few words on the rotational dynamics. If the steel were constant cross-section, rotational waves would move at about 3,300 meters per second, slower than axial waves, as the speed is governed by the shear modulus of steel, which is smaller than the Young's modulus, which controls the axial wave speed. However, just as with the axial waves, the larger size of the tool joints slows the speed of low frequency waves, but by a greater factor than for axial waves, down to about 3000 meters per second. Again, this depends on the relative size of the tool joints of the pipe. The reason that the speed changes by a greater factor is because the relevant impedance for rotational waves involves the moment of inertia per unit length, not the cross-sectional area and this is proportional to the fourth power of radius. So additionally, the impedance contrast between pipe and collars is much higher for rotational waves than for axial waves. Returning though to two-way travel times, they are a bit longer than for axial waves, though still much faster than for waves in the fluid. A couple of seconds for the 3000 meter drill string, six seconds for the very long 9000 meter drill string. However, Unfortunately for rotational waves, there is no good 
late time approximation. Why is this? It is because the bit boundary condition is completely different. For axial and acoustic waves, there is a dissipative boundary condition. A force variable increases as a velocity variable increases. For rotational waves, this is not true. The model here is for PDC, polycrystalline diamond compact bits, which is the most widely used bit type. They are a type of drag bit, which simply means that the bit is rigid and cut as a dragged across the rock, removing material. The model here is due to Emmanuel de Tournay and simply states that above a small weight and torque threshold, the torque is proportional to the depth of cut and the weight is proportional to the torque. On average, the depth of cut is the axial velocity divided by the rotation speed, leading to the pair of equations you see here. Firstly, you can see that it is very non-linear for rotation. In the first equation, instead of the force term, which is torque here, being proportional to the rotation speed, they are multiplied together. Also, the rotational and axial motions are coupled together. Let's compare the three different situations and the boundary conditions of the system. At the surface, they are very similar. There is normally some kind of control system, or driller, maintaining a constant value, constant weight, or surface ROP, constant rotation speed, constant flow rate. At the bottom, for axial motion and flow, the bottom boundaries are different but similar. In one case a linear damping term, in the other a quadratic damping term. For rotation it is different. In the last slide I showed you the PDC boundary condition. For roller cone bits, a similar condition is appropriate, but with a power C attached to the depth of cut, where C is normally taken as being about a half. Not only does this boundary condition not normally damp, we shall see that it can have negative damping, i.e. introduce more energy into the dynamic system. All of which means that a model with only compliance, a lump parameter model, is not appropriate. What are the consequences of this for rotational dynamics? The first is that oscillations at a lot of different frequencies including very high frequencies, can persist for a long time, even indefinitely. The non-linearities in the system at the bit, and also along the borehole, can produce self-excited oscillations. Small initial disturbances can grow until they dominate the system. Simple lump parameters are inadequate to describe what is going on. Much more on this in the next presentation. Now a short summary of what you've just seen and heard. For the dynamics of the drill string and the drilling system, a one-dimensional model works very well. There may be complicated things happening at the ends, and then waves travelling up and down the borehole connecting them. The dynamics of the drill string can be split into axial, rotational and lateral, combined with the fluid dynamics of the fluid inside the pipe. Natural dynamics don't propagate all the way to surface in general, and we will discuss them separately later on. The late time axial dynamics look like a damped linear system with a characteristic time of seconds. The late time fluid dynamics also look like a damped nonlinear system with a characteristic time of seconds to minutes. As fluid waves are much slower than axial waves, the late times are much later than for axial waves. Rotational dynamics are only very lightly damped, if at all, and rotational waves are a bit slower than axial waves. Thank you for your attention. I hope you will join me again for further presentations. Presentation 2 is on rotational dynamics. Any questions or comments about these presentations should be addressed to the email on the lower right.